I hear myself twice, you don't either. So, uh, well, good morning, church. If we've not yet met yet, my name is Ken, and I am very excited to be worshiping Jesus with this morning. Didn't didn't ZNA do a wonderful job helping us lead this week? And we are we are just so blessed. I was just I've been so grateful all week. You guys mean so much to me. I I just want you to know that you are like my favorite people, the people of Crosswinds, and each one of you. And you're all a mess sometimes, but I still love you. You know, and I'm a mess, and I hope you love me. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I, I love my church family. And, um, you know, whether you're here in person or online, I want you to know this, that whether you're rich or poor, or young or old like Pastor Ken, whether you're black or white or yellow or brown, or consider yourself gay or straight or something else, or whether you're conservative or liberal, or whether you love Jesus or you're just not even sure about him yet, Crosswinds will be a place that you will be loved. Because this is Jesus' church, and he died to show you all love. Today's message is the unseen truth revealed. And while I love you all, sometimes hard words bring soft hearts, and, and soft words make us hard to God. And so some of my words today may be biting, um, but, but, but know that they're said in love because I want you to be close to God. And today is Palm Sunday, and I, you know, I'm preaching a message called The Unseen Truth Revealed. And I decided that I was going to spend my time in the book of John as we head towards the resurrection on Easter. And I did that because John uses the word truth more than any other gospel writer. And actually 50% of his writings is that last week um, coming into the the Holy Week. And uh, he records a lot of Jesus' words. And and so today, we're going to, from Jesus' words, we're going to talk about hearts that truly worship God. In John 4, 23 through 24, it says this, But the hour is coming, And it's now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And friends, people in this world worship in all kinds of ways. And with all kinds of motives. But to truly worship what is required is an authentic, surrendered heart to God. The style doesn't matter. What matters is the authentic heart surrendered to God. And and today in the text, I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to do kind of a flyover of a lot of John chapter 12 to show you what I believe John is trying to tell us about what it is to truly worship Jesus. So please open your Bible to John chapter 12. And if you don't have one, raise your hand and the deacons will come by and they'll give you a Bible. And I, I may not hit every verse, so, so you may need a Bible to, you know, see what I missed. It starts this way. It says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Friends, something big had just happened. Jesus had called a man who had been dead for three days out of the grave, and he just walked out alive again. He didn't even stinketh, as his sister Martha feared. He was perfect. Dead, four days in a grave, and now alive. And John tells us that this miracle got the Pharisees and the chief priests talking. They were fearful. They were jealous, plotting to kill Jesus. And they said this in John eleven forty eight: If we let him go on like this, Everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. And so instead of worshiping Jesus, who just raised a man from the dead, who had the power over life and death, they were more interested in their self-interest. That that somehow their their place of power would be taken away. And, And Jesus, at this time now, was in Bethany, about two miles from Jerusalem, with his disciples, and his disciples and his friends were just so grateful to him for bringing Lazarus back to life. 
And so they had a dinner to honor him. And a heart that truly worships God is one that is truly grateful. And while they were eating, and, and the fact that they're eating is kind of important here. That's why John points it out. He, he wants to cast away any doubt that Lazarus is raised to life again in the body. That he's not just there in some spirit. John does the same thing after Jesus' death, uh, crucifixion, uh, by crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. The first thing John reports Jesus doing with his disciples when he's with him is having a little breakfast of fish and bread. Now, disciples like us, we love to get together and eat. You can tell, okay? We, we, we love to eat, but that's not what's important here. What's important is that John is portraying both Jesus and and Lazarus alive again in physical bodies. They're not some disembodied spirits. Spirits don't eat food. The food would just fall through Casper, right? It's just going through you. People with bodies eat. True worshipers of God believe Jesus bodily rose from the grave. And, and the Bible uses this as a sign of true and false worshipers. 1 John 4, 1, 12 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world, and by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, and every spirit that does not confess is Jesus is not from God. Again, friends, we must worship in spirit and in truth. There's a lot of false spirits out there in the world right now. A lot of false teachers, a lot of false things going on. And if you're worshiping just the spirit of Jesus, if you're just worshiping the teaching of Jesus, if you're just worshiping the love of Jesus or the consciousness of Jesus, instead of a resurrected, living, bodily Jesus, you're not in the truth according to the Bible. It's really important what I just said. So you don't get tossed away in the wrong direction. Mary is worshiping here a physical Jesus. The text says in verse 3, Mary took a pound of expensive ointment and made pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with perfume, the, the sweet fragrance of the perfume Imagine the scene here, friends. Jesus is reclining at the table with his friends, and Mary takes the most valuable thing she owns. Spices that are in this perfume were, were part of a woman's dowry. It, it's how they carried their wealth around, because at that time, perfume spices were very valuable and, and small to carry and easy to sell if you needed money. In a sense, this was probably Mary's whole bank account. And she wanted to show gratitude and love and adoration to Jesus, the one who had saved her brother from death's clutches. And because he had been so kind to her. And, and she's not thinking about what other people think because it was not appropriate for a woman in their culture to let down her hair. This was extravagant. And, and some will think that this is wasteful to have two pounds of valuable ointment poured out. It's like a, a quarter of gallon of perfumed ointment. I, I th some of you women might know this, but a, a good woman's perfume might cost like $10 an ounce. So like in our, today's dollars would be like worth $320, which is a lot of money. But in the first century, the value of this spiced nard or perfumed nard would be a year's salary. A year's salary. Mary's worship showed true love for Jesus. It was extravagant. It was intimate. It cost her a lot. It was authentic love that she wanted to bless him with. She was not doing it as a show. Actually, those who saw her do it ridiculed her, according to the Bible. She just worshiped in a way that showed how much she valued him. 
Now the crowd watching was not impressed at all by her love. And Judas, the the treasurer for Jesus' disciples, said this, Why was that ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? See, Judas, he he didn't see the value of Jesus. His heart was not truly devoted to God. It was devoted to himself. Because the text says he didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the habit of taking whatever he wanted from the disciples' treasury and just using it for his own needs. And Mary's extravagant worship was taken away from his prophets. But doesn't he sound so spiritual, so pious, and so religious? This is a waste. We should be caring for the poor. And many today criticize Jesus' church for how we spend our money. But often I have found that the, that the ones complaining are not even the ones that are significantly giving to the church. And sometimes they're not even giving at all. And they complain to cover their own guilt or shame about not giving to God. And it's a way to sound so spiritual to not give of this way God intended. Because God intended for our giving to be cheerful and, and joyful and grateful for all that God has given us. And, and those who truly worship in their giving understand that God gives them more than they could ever give back. And they, they believe what his word says in the Old Testament. In Malachi, it says, test me in this and see if I will not open the window of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Being a pastor for 18 years, I've seen generous people and I've seen how God's blessed them. God loves a cheerful giver. Instead, there are many today in the church, they rob God like Judas. And the truly sad part is they are truly robbing themselves. Yet their arguments to themselves sound so spiritual and logical. I just need to steward my money. I don't trust Jesus' church because they don't spend it in ways like me. They're too, too, too extravagant with what they spend. They need to be cheaper about it. We, we need junk for Jesus out there, right? That's always what shows up in the church, junk for Jesus. Mary didn't bring junk for Jesus. She brought her best for Jesus. And maybe they think, well, I go somewhere overseas, and I don't know what Andre and Rena do with it. It doesn't benefit me. See, this is Judas' attitude towards worship. It's, it's selfish, and it's, it's entitled, which is, is not the true heart of worship. That's grateful. And just abandon and trust to give to the one we truly love. How we spend our time and our money shows the truth about what we truly love. And what Judas truly loved, the money, led to death, not life. Jesus sees the false motive in Judas and says, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. John 12, 7 through 8. Let me ask you, are the poor more important to you than Jesus? Many in the church today could care less about spending time with Jesus and personal, authentic worship. Many in the church today could care less about obeying his mission in the world to share the gospel and and fund the spread of his gospel. They just feel good about giving to the poor. It makes them feel righteous in themselves, apart from Jesus, apart from his true mission in the world. It's something they can control a way they believe they are finding salvation by being good or appearing good in everyone's eyes. Now, friends, I want to tell you, giving to the poor is good. And Jesus would commend it. But that's not his main goal or command. Doesn't doesn't the great commandment say you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind? 
That's the first one, right? And that's the first and the greatest commandment. The second is just like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And on these two commandments depends all the law and the prophets. Matthew 22, 37 through 40. Friends, what's first? Love for God. The truth is Judas is doing neither here, is he? He's not generous towards God's plan in the gospel. He's stealing from it. And he's not generous towards his brothers and sisters because he's stealing from them. He may be in Jesus' presence. He may appear like a worshiper, but his heart is not with him. Friends, where's your heart today? Now, many today follow a social gospel instead of the gospel. And Jesus places the priority of our efforts here on what? that he and his father planned before the foundations of the world to show love to us. A gospel where he had to die for our sins so that we could be forgiven and given everlasting life. Those that practice the social gospel don't even talk about that. Think about this truth. Is it love to just feed a hungry child and not tell them about Jesus? No, you've only helped them be fed for a very short time. Jesus loves them, and he wants them to be fed forever. You know, I saw a lady from a false teaching church that doesn't believe the gospel this week post on social media. Christianity is just all about loving people like Jesus. Sounds good, right? But her view of love is off because the way Jesus loved people was by telling them the truth about God's desire to forgive them for their sin in him. Yes, he healed people. Yes, he fed the poor. But that's not why he came. He came to die for them so he could love them forever. Don't believe a church that says, we just need to love people and not speak the gospel. The word worship means obey. And to to truly worship Jesus, we must not be like Judas looking for our own benefit, people liking us because we do such good things and good works. But we obey him in love, telling them the truth that that they must turn from their sin and follow him and, and avoid eternity in hell because that's not what God wants for them because he loves them so deeply. Jesus is the way the truth, and the life, not love. Sounds shocking, right? To some of mine, love is the reason he is God's way. But feelings, loving feelings, are not the way. Don't believe people's emotional lies that can lead you to false worship. Let's fly over this chapter some more and see what we can find about true hearts of worship like Mary. Verse 9 says, There was a large crowd of Jewish people who worshipped God and heard that Jesus was at the party. And they came. But not because they truly loved Jesus. They just want to see the spectacle. Text says they want to see Lazarus, the one Jesus raised from the dead. They were curious. They were not worshiping Jesus. You know, many today are curious about Jesus. They've heard about his miracles and all the stuff he does, and they maybe hope for him to do a miracle for them. And they come only here when they need something. There's a mentality is, let's see what we can get from Jesus. Unlike Mary, who came with a grateful heart, who desired to give to the one who had given her so much. We live in a very consumer age in the church. It's miles wide of people looking for what they can get from the church and Jesus. They come to be served rather than to serve. Oh, the church must have the right music style for them, the the right kids programs for their kids to be taken care of in. And, 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 And the pastor must make them feel better about themselves in this message. And I know I'm failing at that right now, aren't I? But I do love you. 
enough to risk telling you the truth. Jesus' church is to be a fellowship where we all make sacrifices and learn to serve one another in love. But today, many believe it's a cruise ship where the staff, that would be Natasha and Emil and I, and the 20% who volunteer to serve them are waiting on them. We're on a cruise ship. And you know, often that same 20% are the same 20% that give as well. 80% are kind of being like these Jews, aren't they? Just coming for the spectacle, what they can get. Frankly, wasn't that the reason why Judas was there? And you know where that led him. Now there's another group with them, the leaders. The leaders who serve God but did not have true motives to worship God. And so it says this, so the chief priest made a plan to put Lazarus to death as well because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. These church leaders, they didn't even desire to fellowship with poor Lazarus. I mean, the guy's been dead. He's having a bad week. First he was sick, and then he's dead, and he's literally falling apart. He's all bloated and putrefied and starting to smell in the grave. Four days. No embalming. And, 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 and fortunately, he had a friend like Jesus who created him. And so Jesus puts him back together like he does with all of us. But emotionally, it had to be a really rough week for Lazarus, don't you think? Are the leaders of his church wishing him well? No, they're planning to whack him. That's their goal. That doesn't seem so nice for churchy guys, right? Who, who are, are supposed to serve God. This is it's not church behavior, is it? Poor Lazarus can't catch a break. Why do they want to kill poor Lazarus? Well, you know, it was Jesus the one that called out their hypocrisy, and they're concerned that they can't control him, and he might cause trouble with the Romans. But why Lazarus? Oh, wait. Lazarus just breathing was evidence of who Jesus was. It validated that he was sent by God. Plus, for the chief priest, there was another reason. Lazarus hanging around messed with his doctrine. Don't want to do that to a church leader. See, Caiaphas was a Sadducee, and Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection. That was not part of their pet doctrine. And, and Lazarus proved the priest doctrinally, doctrinally were, were wrong. What is true about your worship of Jesus? Do you worship Jesus because you believe you are right or you believe he is right? Are you jealous when you see God bless someone you feel is more sinful and less mature than you are? Do you think, hey, I'm the one doing right here. They should get what they deserve for their errors. Is that your attitude? I'm right. Give to me, God, what I deserve. You don't really want that? God gives us all his grace, which for each of us is better than we deserve. What all us leaders deserve is hell. But he freely gives us forgiveness of sin and everlasting life. Caiaphas is a leader in the church. He knew God's word better than anybody. But his standard was himself and what he thought was right, not God's standard. I mean, isn't killing someone a pretty obvious no-no according to God's word? I mean, isn't that a pretty obvious one? I mean, you might like excuse your little white lies or you're overeating, but killing, that's like in the top 10. 
But that's, that's where this church leader's heart is. It's murderous. What's more, he feels justified in it because it's practical. He's, he's fulfilling some greater good. He's probably deluded enough to think he's doing this for God. But the unseen truth is he is serving himself, isn't he? Leaders, do you serve out of gratitude to God or because it makes you feel right and important over other people? Are you jealous when somebody else like Lazarus is blessed? Are, are you more afraid of what the crowd thinks than what God thinks? Then you're worshiping the wrong thing. Turn and humble yourself and worship Jesus. He is here to die for you too. Next, we'll fly over into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And surely, here we must see true worship. I mean, it's Palm Sunday. It's a time in Jesus' ministry where everything just feels so right. The crowd is cheering for him, and they're waving their little palm fronds at him. After all, the mistreatment that he had received from all the Pharisees and stuff, finally, the king of all creation is, is getting his due. The crowd is praising him in exuberant worship. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And there's Jesus. Doesn't have a big head about it. He, he, he's not coming to town to tell everybody what they're doing wrong and set the Romans straight. Just show them who's in charge. No, he found a young donkey and he sat on it to ride into town. And John tells us this is all ordained by God, written by the prophet Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous and having salvation. He is humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, a foal of a donkey. Oh, this worship of Jesus feels so great, our humble king. I just have praise pimples thinking about it. Jesus deserves our love and affection and praises. But is this worship in spirit and in truth? Yes, it is spirited. Everybody's got their arms in the air. The crowd has got a spirit of excitement, but there's no truth yet. Jesus tells us his own posse didn't even get the truth of it. It says his disciples did not even understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. Jesus is going to be praised, even if the rocks have to do it, because he is kings. But his own disciples don't even grasp the truth of that. That he is truly the son of God, the, the author of all life, the one by whom they and everything else in the universe was made. They're just all grooving with this amazing worship music. But they didn't get the truth of it. How about the crowd themselves? Did they get it? There's some pretty authentic excitement about Jesus. Jesus. But the text tells us the part of the crowd came because they saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. And the text says the rest went to meet him because they heard on Twitter about Lazarus. <laughs> Jesus is trending in Jerusalem. There's posts being shared from mouth to mouth about what he has done. That day, Jesus had many fans. Jesus is getting many likes. It's just crazy on his feed. There. There was a, a great worship experience for all who came. It was like going to a concert of Brandon Lake at the United Center. Everybody's there together and is excited about what God is going to do. Everybody's singing the same tune, praising God. But the hearts of crowds are very fickle. You may be trending one moment and then something else more shiny takes the crowd's attention away. The same ones who are praising him now, saying, Hosanna, which means God save us. 
in a few days, that same crowd will be returning to worshiping their own fears. And Jesus' fans will cry out, Crucify him! Even his close followers would lie that they even knew the man and they abandoned him. Friends, it's easy to worship Jesus when things look good. When there's extra money in the bank. When the bills are paid. When your family's health is good and when everybody likes you and they like what you're worshiping. But what do you do when all that is going the other way when people curse you for worshiping him when you lose your job because you follow him when your family is in a season of sickness and deaths seem greater than births friends do you praise him then is your song grateful like job who when disaster struck sang praises to god naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Are you still in the truth with a grateful heart in all circumstances? Because even in our trials, even in the worst of our trials, he has given us more than we deserve, and he promises more than we can even imagine. Friend, are you a fan of Jesus or are you a follower? Fans are fickle. They leave at the first sign of trouble, first sign of adversity. They're gone. Or are you a follower who will never leave him because you believe the truth that Peter exclaimed, where else would we go? You have the words of eternal life. Friend, do you really believe what Paul said in Romans 8, 18? For I consider that the, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For see, that's what it truly means to worship him, to trust what he says more than your present circumstances and your current understanding. One more flyover. And then we'll see what Jesus has to say about worshiping in spirit and truth. Now, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. In Jerusalem, there's quite a crowd forming, for it was the Passover. And there were pilgrims from all over Judea coming into town for this Passover. And there was a huge crowd for Jesus' parade on a donkey. Could have been up to 2,500 people. And his story is becoming known. The text tells us us these fellow Greeks came. The Greeks were typically pagans who believed in many gods. But the text says that they came to the festival to worship the one true God at the Passover feast. Now, they wouldn't be accepted by the crowd. They, They would not even be let into the inner court of the temple because they were considered by everybody unclean. Not even the Roman officials dared to go inside of the Jewish temple. The ancient historian Josephus tells us there are warning signs all over the temple written in Greek and in Latin. And they warned non-Jews not to proceed into the temple courts. These signs were serious. It wasn't just to keep out. It was no foreigner is to enter within the forecourt and the barrier around the sanctuary. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame for his subsequent death. Aren't you glad you get to see Kathy when you come to church? <laughs> Greeting you and welcoming you here. I mean, think about that first impression as a seeker. How many today, friends, do not enter God's church because they have been told or been given the idea from people who say they worship God that they will be condemned by him. Many people out there feel that way. That's why we need to go to them. They they have that, 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 that wrong lie in their head. 
Later, Jesus will, in righteous anger, start flipping tables in the, in the court because the merchants, the Jewish merchants, were blocking seekers like these Greeks from learning about his father God. His house, his father's house, was to be a place of prayer where people could come in and, and, and talk to God. And yet, these so-called believers have become merchants and turned it into a den of robbers. True worshipers of Jesus warmly welcome outsiders to come worship with them. Do you greet those who come to worship with us here on Sunday morning? Or do you judge them because they don't know the protocol and maybe sit in your family's designated seating place? There aren't any, but there are. I think you should all move around next week. So we don't ever give anybody that idea, right? Do you kind of look at them because maybe they don't act or dress like you or their kids don't act or dress like you and your kids? Or are you encouraging and welcoming to those who might be coming feeling a little condemned, feeling like a little outsider? Do you go beyond that? Do you go beyond just greeting them at church and Invite them, go to their homes and walk and invite them to come in. You know, we'd wanna, so we've done about 70 home visits in the last couple of weeks. Are you, are you part of that? Do you, do, you, do you pray for your neighbors, even the ones that annoy you? Jesus loves and died for them too. How can we worship in truth if we really don't care about our neighbors around us? Are we worshiping in truth? especially the easy ones in the seats in front of you and behind you. If you do not say hello to someone today, are you really worshiping yourself or your fears and not God? Are, Are you doing anything in your life helping bring people to worship Jesus? Or are you like Philip here? This stinky fisherman, who in his pride is standing as a bouncer to see who he let behind the rope to see Jesus. Oh, nope, not you, Greek. We know this is true. Because the guys come up and they say, Sir, We're here to see Jesus. And Philip said, or the text says, Philip went and told Andrew, and Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. So, friends, there's no need to go tell, (laughs) right? No need to go tell Andrew unless you're asking his opinion on whether we should let those Greeks in. What do you think? And neither of them could decide, and these are his disciples, so they have to go talk to Jesus. Did they not know his mission by now? Have they not been listening to what he's been saying? And Jesus answered them. Well, who's the them? Those filthy fishermen and those Greeks, they thought unclean. Those were the them. Jesus had to come to teach them what true worship was. That God was about to tear the temple curtain and lift the rope so that all could come in and intimately worship him. And Jesus says this, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls unto the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. How was the Son glorified? How is the Son most praised? in his death, burial, and resurrection. Jesus did not come to be a good teacher, even though he was. He did not come to do all kinds of kind things for the poor and his fellow man, even though he did. Friends, he came to die. For him, great worship was not about who had the greatest temples, who had the most eloquent priests, and the most relevant, upbeat music. This is what the Apostle Paul wrote about how Jesus worshipped. Who, though he was in the form of God, 
did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of man and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of our God and Father. Amen? Amen. Jesus is most glorified in his surrender. The greatest act of love to God is to empty oneself. Jesus said, the hour has come. This is why the Greeks were invited in. Most of Jesus' ministry was this to his own people who rejected him. But God's plan from the beginning was for all nations, for all people to be blessed in him. He came to die for them all. Not just Christians, but the Muslims, the Buddhists, the transvestites, the LBGTQ, the criminals, and the politicians. Sorry, that was redundant. The white supremacists, the terrorists, the agnostics, and the atheists. All those who believe in him and all those who reject him. Jesus did not come to lift himself over people, but to surrender his life to save people. And Paul exhorts us all to have that same mind. And Jesus right here is teaching us by example how to truly worship him. We are to be those seeds that fall to the ground and die to ourselves. Notice he he says, if we die, we bear much fruit. But he's also saying there, it's it's a little tricky to look at, but if we don't die, we remain alone. We are self-focused and alone in hell. But if we die, we bear fruit. Biblically, what is fruit? Bueller? What is fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, but it's love. How do God's words say husbands should love their wives as Christ loved the church, sacrificially surrendering their lives for their wives? How are wives to love their husbands through sacrifice, submitting everything to their husbands? Real love is not a feeling, friends. It's a doing. It's laying down your life for others. What did Jesus say in John 15, this is my commandment that I have, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than someone lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. Friends, this is true worship of God. My friends, laying down your pride Laying down your selfishness for the benefit of another person. What's Paul's appeal to the church in Romans 12? I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That's true worship, friends. Jesus surrendered his life for us on the cross to shield us from the wrath of God, which was the just penalty that our selfish sin deserves. And to truly worship him is to do the same for others. Not to stand over others in our pride or ignore them in our selfishness, but to lay all that down that they might know him and know his love. King Jesus said, whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. We finish with his words. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Today, friends, if you are a true worshiper of Jesus, you must daily die to yourself. 
You don't have some special privilege. Jesus says that it's for anyone. Anyone who says they serve him dies. For that is the unseen truth, often, of real worship. It's not being excited and grooving to music. It's it's not getting the praise of man for doing a good thing for the poor. It's not having the respect as a leader in his church. It's not being part of the in religious crowd. It's following him wherever he goes. And where he goes is to die, the place of self-sacrifice for the benefit of those he loves. That's where he is. And if you want to be where Jesus is, that's where you go. He went to a place of self-sacrifice even for his enemies. He saw the benefit of the very ones who beat him and mocked him and nailed him to a cross. And instead of giving them wrath, he cried out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. To serve him, we must die to ourselves for him for the sake of all. That is worshiping in his spirit and in the truth. Surrendering our lives is how we truly live. And we know that because on the third day, Jesus, the one who surrendered his life for us, walked out of the grave alive again and alive forever. And that proved the paradox of what Jesus said. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus says words like whoever and anyone. Today, it does not matter what you have done or what you have not done. Today, it truly matters whether you're willing to die for him that you might truly live. You may say, well, I believe in him. Well, so do his fans. True worshipers obey his command to die. Remember Mary? Mary? She gave up all her wealth, her reputation with the crowd, even her beauty. I'm sure you're really having a bad hair day with nard and street dirt in your hair. Not so pretty. But she laid down her life in gratitude to the one who truly loved her. I want you to imagine what happened after she truly worshipped Jesus. I want you to imagine this scene. She, she walked down the marketplace full of stinky, unclean animals and people. But she was clothed in expensive perfume from laying down her life for Jesus. And because of her sacrifice, she became a grace to the noses of all that she passed by. A sweet fragrance of good against the stench of a lost and broken world. Her world and the world was better because of her sacrifice for Jesus. Beloved, that's what happens when we are willing to lay our lives down for him. Others can smell at us. They can smell it on us. They can smell his goodness. Today, come with a surrendered heart and die to yourself and make him your Lord. Proclaim today the sweet message that in his death you have found real, true, and eternal life. Judas tried to preserve his life, his own interest, and he died alone. But Mary died to herself. And Jesus, and the other gospels say, made her name truly immortal. Today, follow her as she follows Jesus to the often seen truth in this world of true worship, which is laying down your life for him. Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for your word. It exposes us, exposes every false attitude and motive in our hearts. Lord, let that falseness go away right now for each of us. 
Let us turn from our sin and from our selfishness and turn and show you gratitude and praise. Let us put our trust in you, not the things of this world. Let us die from the world and live in you. Father, if there's somebody here today that is just learning about you, they didn't know. Father, I pray that right now they would turn their faith in the one that's loved them since before the foundations of this earth and will always truly love them. They'll turn from the sin and the things of this world and believe upon what he did for them, that he lived, died, and was raised. Did what no one else could ever do. Take the burden of the sin right off their back. It's gone. Gave them everlasting life. Let them receive that gift right now of everlasting life. Let them receive the gift of becoming his child, forever loved. Let them come and bow down and truly worship him. Lord, I come to you today as the mule you rode in on, Lord. You are the great one. Let your name be praised forever. Holy Spirit, come, move in our hearts that we may see the truth about who he is. Father, do a mighty work in this place right now in people's hearts. It's not the external that matters. It matters what happens in their hearts right now. They surrender and worship him. I pray, Lord, that you will lead them there. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Shall I stand?